The title of today's message is Here and Now. Um, I'd like to start in Exodus chapter 17. So uh, if you can see to read your Bible, um, we'll work on that too. Get some house lights up. Um, Exodus 17. So let me, before we start reading, kind of make some comments about a little bit about where we're going today. Uh, you may have a car that's running, but if you never put it into gear, you're not going anywhere. So you may say that you are a Christian. Let's say you, you say, well, I'm a Christian. That word is a movement word. It is a moving word. It is a motion word. Christian is not something that symbolizes something that you become and sit. Christian, you say Christian, that implies follower. That means you're, you're following Jesus, you're living a life, you're moving. One of the number one answers I get from people who say, if I say, well, you know, if you died today, where would you go? If you died right now, wherever you are, boom, where would you go? And some people say, I have no idea. Some people say straight to hell. I know I'm lost, you know, I'm in trouble. But I get a lot of people that say, well, I hope I'd go to heaven. And I say, well, what is your hope based on? They say, well, I try to be a good person. Um, I'm trying to do the right thing, try to be a good person. And as I've said for decades now, being good is never bad. It's just never going to be good enough. Being good is not what gets you into heaven. That God is good and offered his son to die on the cross, be buried and raised from the dead as a gift to us, that's what's good and that's what we either have or we don't have. So some people say, well, I became a Christian by believing. I trusted in him. And then something weird happens. They go back to just trying to be good. They're not, you say, well, but that life looks Christian. I know people that are not believers that out Christian Christians. There are religious people that keep all the rules. They live by all of the systems. And if you meet them, they're not, they're, they are law abiding. They're not cussing, drinking, whatever you think, you know, Christians should be or not be. They're living it. They're outliving a lot of Christians if good was the category. But this is not about becoming a Christian and then going back to just trying to be good. It is about having an ongoing working relationship with God where you hear his voice. And if you've listened to me preach for any amount of time and go back, you will hear this theme. I, I am very concerned about what the scripture says because that's the primary place that we hear his voice. So you have to read the scriptures. If you're not reading the scriptures, you're not gonna marinate in who he is and what he's about. But if you read the scriptures just for the purpose of gleaning and gathering information about God or theology, all these things, I'm fine with that. But if you have no interest in him and knowing him and following him, where does it all go? Nowhere. Paul, before he met Jesus, was a tremendously religious person. So religious on the side that he was on to begin with that he thought persecuting, getting Christians arrested and killed was the thing to do. He was, he was passionate. But then that flipped and he was not just passionate about being a do-gooder, keeping a bunch of rules. Paul knew Jesus. He had an encounter with Jesus and he followed Jesus and he knew Jesus. And so I keep coming back to this over and over again because we can fall into being nice people. We help old ladies across the street. We give some money to charity. But if you ask yourself, is it all being done in Jesus' name and at his prompting, is that what it is? Uh, I told you the other day uh, about my car, a gate in the wind, and I don't know if you remember this. And some of the people said they went out and looked at my car and so the gate closes on my car. I stopped, but it gashed. It put a gash about that big. The screw in the gate just, you know, ground and through the paint and took out my door. So I told you that I said, okay, Lord, you know, this is not good. I'm not happy. A door can be repaired, but what is this about? So I started praying about where I was going to take that car to see if they could touch it up or something. A few days ago. I'm driving around, been praying, praying, praying. I say, Lord, where am I supposed to go? He said, go back to that body shop by, the old, by your old house. 
And you say, well, what do you mean he said go back to that body shop? Uh, if you don't hear his voice, you don't know what I'm talking about. Now, did I hear an audible voice in the car? No. But you have, you, you are a new person. If you're a Christian, you're a new creation. That means you have new ears, new heart, new everything. So there's some things I can hear with these ears. There are other things I can hear with those ears. And when he says, go over there. So I whip it in there, get out of the car, guy comes out, young guy, turns out he's the manager of the whole place. And I said, excuse me, could you help me? You know, what is your advice? Can I buy a little pen somewhere and, you know, fix this? And I was about to scratch. So he has one of the body shop guys whip me up a little bottle of black paint and comes out there himself. And I said, look, I'm not sure how to ask you this or say this, but this isn't about the scratch on my car. I said, my car got scratched, and whether you understand this or not, God sent me here, and I think you're the reason. And I said, is all I, this is all I said to him. Is there anything going on in your life where if someone were willing to pray for you, you would, you would welcome that? And his eyes lit up. He said, my wife and I are trying to have a baby. And so I talked to him about that. And then I got into whether he was a Christian, turns out he was, and that his grandfather or somebody had been a pastor and he had been out of church and you know everything, just gone. He'd just been out there. And I said, so let me explain this to you. I said, I don't end up places randomly. Sometimes maybe but I'm trying to do what God wants me to do and go where he sends me. I said, so the same God who created the universe sent me to you. That's how much he values you. That's how much he cares about you and knows you're alive. And if he started something in you, he's going to finish it. And I'm here to encourage you in that regard. Now, that's a great day. Now, my car still jank, you know, scratched up. He touched it up and you can't see it. Uh, old people don't know it's there. So, um, <laughs> but you say, well, well, what is that about? The stuff that you think is terrible stuff, a challenge, a situation where God says, okay, now what are you going to do? I've allowed this. Are you going to trust me? And we go, no, I'm not going to trust you. This sucks. This is terrible. This is not good. What are you doing? You're supposed to be taking care of me. Uh, one more story before we read this. Uh, my youngest daughter works for a company, and she had a massive situation with passwords, all this stuff going on, Google, I don't even know what it was. But I was told, help her. So I found a number called Google, held for an hour and a half, 45 minutes one day. They finally picked it up. I patched her in. We talked to him. Lost that call. That guy dropped. Did it again the next day. And you say, well, why would, why would you do that? That's not your job. That's not your problem. Do you know what the answer is? I am her father. I am her father. Now, if I have an impulse to help my kids, my wife, my family, or even friends, and I would go to some extreme, then why do you think for even a millisecond that your heavenly father would not mobilize heaven and earth and all, all his resources to take care of you? What do you think he's doing up there? So Exodus 17 verse 1. Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin in, according to the commandment of the Lord and camped in Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So the, this is the Exodus. Moses is leading the people out and they get to this place and there's no water. You got to have water. Therefore, the people contended with Moses and said, give us water that we may drink. Dude, we got to have water. Where's our water? We're out here in the wilderness. We're supposed to be following you and God's in this. Where's our water? So Moses said to them, why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water and the people complained against Moses and said, 
Why is it that you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Of all the dumb whatever things you could do, and here we are, we're all going to die out here of something as simple as thirst. You made no provision. We're all, we're all dead. Now, go back and remember what has just happened. They have survived plagues, Passover, all the firstborn animals, people in Egypt are dead. And if you put the blood over the, the, the doorpost of your house and you're in the house, the death passed over you and you made it. And now you're going to be out of Egypt. You're not going to be slaves after hundreds of years of that. And you're, and, and you're on your way. And I'm telling you within days, it's like God doesn't even exist. You cannot ditch on God just because you hit a bump in the road. Even if the bump in the road looks like, oh, we don't have any water. Who do you think this God is? He made water. He can have things materialize out of nowhere. And if, they, if you keep reading the story, he's got food falling out of the sky every day for him. He can be trusted. He will take care of you. So there have been situations in our lives, my, me, my wife, our kids, and one of the things I've, I say out loud to Rebecca when we're praying or talking about these things, I say, sweetheart, he's way ahead of us. This is not like God is going to show up in your situation. He's already shown up in your future. He's way out there. And he is solving challenges that I have today, but he knows of challenges that I don't know about that are coming where I will need him. And frankly, I don't want to know about those challenges because I might not be able to absorb that. But he's already making a way, way out there. So what is, what is he going to have to do for us to trust him? He sends his only son down here not for a weekend, but to live and be persecuted and called names and, you know, just a mess. And then he dies on a cross and is buried and raised from the dead. And we go, wow, it's amazing. It's extraordinary. And then we start, then the devil says, well, yeah, he saved you. He's going to get you into heaven, but he, he can't get you through life. What are you going to do now? What are you going to do now? What if he ditches on you? You got no ditch verses. You got no ditch verse. He's not going to ditch. You ditch on him, he doesn't ditch on us. So where's our water? Verse 4, so Moses cried out to the Lord saying, what shall I do with this people? They're almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel. Also take in your hand your rod with which you struck the river and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb. So he told him a specific place to go. And you shall strike the rock and water will come out of it that the people may drink. Um, now you say, well, there's the answer. It ain't over. Now you've got to be willing to hit a rock with a rod like that's going to do something. That's crazy stuff. What if I hit the rock and nothing happens? I'm going to look like stupid. You're going to look really stupid if there was water there the whole time and you didn't hit the rock. Behold, I will stand there, strike the rock, water will come out, people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So he called the name of the place Massah and Meribah because of the contention of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord saying, and this is what he summed it up as, is the Lord among us or not? If you're a Christian, the question is never, is the Lord among us because he lives in you? He cannot not be in you if you're a Christian. Now, if you're not a Christian, you, you have God everywhere around you except in you. That's why life is so empty and you're so desperate. You feel so lost because you don't have him not just with you, but in you. You've got to get him in you. In the same way you can be surrounded by oxygen, if you don't have it in you, you will die. You can be surrounded by water. If you don't get it in you, you will die. Surrounded by food. If you don't get it in you, you will die. 
And it's the same way with Jesus. If you don't have him in you, you will die, and spiritually you'll be dead forever in a real hell. Go to Numbers chapter 14. Just, this is another situation with the people of Israel and just to let you see what happens with these people. Uh, Numbers 14, verse 19. Again, Moses talking to, to God on behalf of the people and, he's, and God's about done with them. Pardon the iniquity of this people, I pray, according to the greatness of your mercy, just as you have forgiven this people from, you have forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. Now let's look at what the Lord says in verse 20. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word, but truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness have not put me to the test, have, have put me to the test now these 10 times and have not heeded my word. They certainly shall not see the land which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who reject me see it. Now, these were God's people. He brought them out of Egypt. If you're a Christian, you are God's child. You can miss what he's promised. You'll still make heaven, but you can wander around the rest of your life and go, what's going on? And what's the problem? It's the same problem they have. They have put me to the test, how many times I put him to the test, and what is the issue? They have not heeded my voice. So you say, well, I, do, I still don't understand what you're talking about. I don't hear his voice. I am telling you, if you're a Christian, you could not become a Christian without hearing his voice. He has to speak to you. You have to be made aware that you're lost, that you need a savior. You know that you need to repent, that to stop saying, I can get me in. He's the only one that can get me in. That, that's, the, that's the answer. And then you say, well, okay, I've got my ticket. I'm out. I'm going to go do what I want to do. It, it, it's not supposed to work that way. You say, well, I don't hear him anymore. Um. There's a Christian radio station. Uh, we happen to be on this station. There's two of them in town. Uh, 90.9 is one of them, and the other one is 100.7. Can anybody in this room right now hear, hear either of th those two stations? They are broadcasting in this room right now. You hear them right now. Do you know why you don't hear them? You don't have a receiver on tuned to that station. So if you get your receiver on, you are your heart, you, you are the receiver, and you tune it to him, you'll, oh my goodness, he's broadcasting today. He's broadcasting every day, all day long. Well, I don't hear him. Maybe you need to tune in. Well, I don't want to hear what he has to say. I found me another station, and it, it's playing things that I like to hear. It's not that he's not broadcasting. It's a question of whether we're, we, if you're a Christian, you're a receiver of his forgiveness, his mercy, eternal life, but now are we willing to be receivers of what he has for us to be and do? Psalm 95. Now, if you hadn't figured this out by now, I read you a ton of scripture. I am not one of these preachers that picks a word and then dissects it for 45 minutes, you know, and for the dyslexic people, what it means backwards. You know, I'm like, what? what? I'm not saying this, it's not a thing and it's not okay. I'm, I get it. I am trying to get you to hear scripture and go, oh my, my goodness, that spoke to me. What else is in here? I can only give you so much in a few minutes, but you can spend your whole week. Uh, here, here's an interesting thing if you don't have this on your phone. If your phone is set to do this, it will occasionally alert you to screen time hours or minutes. Does everyone know what I'm speaking about? Set you something on scripture time. It'll go off and tell you how many hours you've spent in the scripture. Oh, I need to back down. That's way too much time in the scripture. It shows I've been on TikTok for nine hours this week. 
Well, Lord, you understand. I just don't have time to read that Bible. Where am I getting my TikTok time? And then you wonder why you have a TikTok life. If that's what your appetite is, and that's what feeds your soul and your life, you got to keep eating that. You say, but there's some good stuff on TikTok. Some good stuff in here, too. Psalm 95. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is great and the great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the days of the trial in the wilderness. When your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they saw my work. For 40 years I was grieved with that generation and said, it is a people who go astray in their hearts. And they do not know my ways, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So he references what I just read you when we started. Uh, there's a couple of people in the room today who came to town. They're here for church. And there's a John Mayer concert in Dallas tonight. And I, I like John Mayer music. Um, it's very fascinating to me about music. Uh, if you offered somebody Elton John tickets, there's not many people going to turn that down. And you don't have many people going... Oh, when is Elton ever going to shut up? My goodness. Elton, we've been doing this for two hours. And then he sings his last song, and they get up and try to scream some more to get Elton to come back out and do another one. Not much encore at church. Man, is this ever going to end? I'm getting hungry. Oh, they start early. They got all that music. You know, I don't know. I, I don't need all that music. I hate to tell you folks, and, and I know this is not going to go over big and I'll lose some more people. You're, unless you got some medical issue, you show where your heart is by how much time you can spend with the family. You're going to drive all the way down here and you can't spend a few more minutes singing some songs and fellowshipping, I just don't get it. I'd start earlier than we start, and we'd have more time to just chill and maybe allow for an encore. Well, I got to get out of here. Where are you going to go? Well, I got to go eat, bring snacks. <laughs> I mean, what are, what are we asking of you? Come gather as a church on a, you know. Man, if you'd swap with me, I was at church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And I know black people, it was Monday through Friday, you know, even Saturday. I don't know, man. You know what I'm saying? Whew. You're trying to figure out how to get saved from being saved. I'm mean, like, <laughs> what in the world? <laughs> at, go to Amos 8. Amos 8, verse 11. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God. And look what he describes at that point in time. 
that I will send a famine on the land. And you say, oh, there's not going to be food. Look at kind of famine. Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. We have people that listen, and there's plenty of people I hope that do this. But sooner or later, you'll be starved for God's word. You're not, you're not going to want to hear somebody tell you how positive you should be. You're going to want to hear what God has to say because there's nothing going to beat Scripture. And if you're a believer, you are going to be hungry for his word. And if you're not a believer, you're going to have some kind of pull toward truth because you realize that what the world's telling you is a bunch of lies. Matthew chapter 7. I think our small groups have gone over this already. Um, and I'm going back over it. Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. You can't just say, oh, Lord, Lord. No, if, you, if you're throwing Lord, Lord out there, I'm watching to see if it's a life of obedience. Because if he's your Lord, in fact, he is the boss of your life. And if he's the boss of your life, you're doing what he's telling you to do. And then that backs up the Lord, Lord claim. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And this, this still blows my mind. And I'm not trying to necessarily guess who these people are. This is bringing it. Who, who are these people? Prophesy in your name. Oh, this such and such is going to happen in your life. Cast out demons, and the demons respond to you, but you're not going to make it into heaven. And done many wonders in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And then you get verse 24. Therefore, because of what he's just said, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them. Because this is the story. He tells you exactly what this parable is going to be about in the first sentence. Whoever hears these sayings of mine, what are, you hear me teaching you, and you do them, this is what I'm going to liken you to. I will liken him. It, it's like you're a wise guy. You're a wise man who built his house on the rock, a good foundation. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. What puts your house on a rock? Hearing Jesus, doing Jesus. But there are other people, and what is their choice? But everyone who hears these things of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Same thing happens. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, beat on that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Because the scribes would tell them to do stuff that they weren't even going to do. And now Jesus is teaching stuff that he not only says is what you got to do, he is, he is what he's telling them. It's just who he is. And he's living that life, and they go, that guy knows what he's talking about. That's authority. What will give you authority with non-believers is to say, yes, he's my Lord, then live a life of obedience. Then when they hear your, your advice, your teaching, they'll go, that's true. I may not like it or agree with it, but I know that's true. Because you're not a hypocrite anymore. Go to Matthew 13. And people say, well, why did Jesus speak in so many parables? He tells you straight up, Matthew 13, verse 13 and following. Therefore, I speak to them in parables because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, hearing you will hear and shall not understand and seeing you will see and not perceive for the hearts of this people. Now look at this. This is what happens to them, but this is what happens to us. The hearts of these people have grown dull. 
Their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. So you get dull of hearing. Um, I'll give you an example of this, and, and, and I've got to be careful for this. And this has happened to me in the last few days. Uh, you can turn a movie on. Here it's a great movie. Maybe it's a great plot. And the movie starts rolling, and all of a it sudden, it's the characters are, God, you know, it's God is damning this, and Jesus Christ, and, you know, you just keep going, oh, okay, well, that's crazy, but okay, that's how people talk. I get occasional letters from people that say things, you know, you said this, and crap, or sucks, or something like that, I, you know. But you, you don't hear me throwing a GD around randomly. You know why? Because your ears couldn't handle it. Not in this setting. But you got other settings. So you say, but you're saying we become dull of hearing. Yeah, you don't hear it anymore. It doesn't affect you. It's just another word. Until I say something about yo mama. Right? Yo mama's so ugly, she, you know, she's got to sneak up. If I come up and say that to you, now we've got to fight. Oh, you're going to defend your mama? What about your Jesus? Amen. Well, but you're taking it to extremes. It's not like, you know, we're, we, we can never watch a movie again. There's always TikTok. Dull of hearing. I'm going to read it to you again. The hearts of these people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing. Their eyes have closed. They should, lest they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. We don't even hear it anymore. Dull of hearing. And, and, and I might read you something right here. You're watching out there, listening out there, and you go, well, yeah, that's true, but is this almost over? Because I've got to get, get back to my life because I'm not going to turn. I'm not going to change. Great thing about reading a lot of Scripture is it's self-pruning in a church. You don't have to ask people to leave. They just can't take it anymore. My nails are longer than they've ever been, but they're still not long enough for some people. You got to find you somebody with really long nails to scratch your ears and tell you what you want to hear, to back up the life you've chosen and tell you that this sin's okay now, this sin's okay, and everybody's doing it, and don't get all alarmed. You just got no verses for that either. John chapter 10. And I've read you this one. It's pretty simple. Verse 27. I'm not going to read you the whole chapter. This is Jesus speaking. And what does he say? My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So back to my story about the body shop. I am one of his sheep. I know his voice. I hear him. And if he says, we're going to this body shop and talk to somebody, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. And that's where we go. I follow him. That's where he wants to go. Well, I don't want to go there. Then you're not following Jesus. That's pretty simple. Well, I'll pick up, I'll pick up tomorrow. Let me tell you what tomorrow turns in. A bunch of tomorrows. Here now. Because the danger is if you're already hard-hearted, dull of hearing as a believer, it'll just get worse and worse and worse. And then you'll just be staring at somebody like nothing's going on and wonder what happened to your life. Go to Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, 11. 
But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, to Christians, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the flesh, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So the question is, are you led every day by the Spirit of God? That's part of the proof that you are his, you are his child. You say, well, dude, I'm saved. What do, you, what do you want from me? I'm not telling you I want anything from you. I'm telling you what he wants from you. He wants to lead your whole life. Not just Savior, he wants to be Lord, the boss of you. I've already talked to parents today. How's it going? Oh, having trouble with my kid. And you know what the number one trouble is? Usually, they don't want to do what you're asking them to do. How, how hard could this be? I'm not trying to ruin your life. You think I am. All I'm asking is, could you help with the dishes? Could you clean your room? Could you, you know, do your homework? This is what we're going to do. Oh, you can't tell me what to do. And we get all upset with our kids. Why don't you ask God if that's how he feels every once in a while? You hate it in your kids, and that's who we end up being. And there may be a direct correlation to a person who will not follow Jesus, who's a believer, and the kid's rebelling against that because they're like, you're claiming to be all that, and you won't even do what God tells you to do, and now you're trying to get me to do what you want me to do. You can't even obey, and you want me to. Show your kids how to follow somebody and do what they say to do, and it might be easier for them to follow you. Instead of this hypocrisy of, oh, you should obey me. I'm like, yeah, mom, you don't obey God. The phone rings and you tell me to say, oh, there, she's not here. You taught me to lie. Oh, that's not a lie. I just don't want to talk to him right now. It's a lie. Pick up the phone and say, hey, I don't want to talk to you right now and hang up on him. That's, that's the truth. <laughs> Second Timothy four. I'm almost done. Two minute warning. Second Timothy four. Um, and this is the danger. And this is Paul writing to one kid, Timothy, saying, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his, in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Now, this is probably, you're not going to like this, this example, but here's one of the big ones going on right now. Church is putting rainbow flags up out in front, and everybody's welcome. Right? Why don't you put flags with bars on them and say all criminals are welcome too? I mean, let's just tell you, everybody, of course everybody's welcome he, here. But now these churches have said, well, but you know, we're going to have elders, gay elders, and this and that. They've lost their minds. And if you don't have the guts to spit that out, you're, you're cruising down, you're drifting. You're gone. Oh, I don't like the way you're, you're, you're a hater. I'm not a hater. I'm just not backing off the book. It ain't changing. So you say, but I feel better and not about offending people, and I want to be nice to everyone, so I'm going to go to a nicer church that'll be nice to people as they enter hell. <laughs> right this way, everybody. We didn't warn you or tell you anything, so right this way. You say, well, but I, I get nervous when you say things like this out loud. Read your Bible. It's in here. Well, but, but I've heard someone explain that away. And they probably explained all your sins away too. Well, it's not really stealing. I just, you know, it's a big company. And they have more than they need. And so now I've got what I need. 
They don't mind. It's just, it's okay. You're a thief. Yeah, I can tell you, I'm too old to be nervous about this anymore. So we may clear the place out. I'm going out in the book. That's just how I'm going out. (laughs) And you say, well, you hate gay people. I don't hate anybody. I'm just telling you, your sin ain't going to get you into heaven. Only Jesus is going to get you into heaven. And you can't get him unless you choose to repent and say, you know. So pick your poison, whatever your sin is. Uh, You got to call it what it is. Because you can't deal with something that's not sin. I just have a problem, or it's not a problem. Uh, This country is in a mess, not because it's just in a mess. This country's in a mess because Christians are cowards. That's why we're in a mess. Because we're so busy about being comfortable and don't want we want everybody to like us. They did not like Jesus. They strung him up to shut him up. Um, marvel not that the world hates you. Now, you don't even have to be, I'm not being mean about it. I'm just telling you, you got to call sin what it is, tell people what the answer is, and then let them deal with it. Um, read Hebrews 2 with me really quick. Look at verse 1, and I'm reading you some really subtle verses. If you read your Bible, you'll see these things. Not so subtle, really. Hebrews 2 1 therefore we must give the most earnest heed to the things we have heard lest we drift away you have to pick a course stay the course because you can be off by one degree and and miles down the road be off by miles give more earnest heed to the things we have heard lest we drift away Hebrews chapter 3, and this is going back over to where we started um, with the water situation. Verse 7, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness. So now he's bringing that up. Where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath that they should not enter my rest. And in that case, it was the promised land. Beware, brethren, written to Christians, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin will harden your heart. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said today, here, now, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, who, indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt, led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that he would not enter his rest? But to those who did not obey. So we see that he could not enter in because of unbelief. Why do we not obey? Well, we have a will. We don't want to do what God wants us to do. And we believe that our way is better than his way. That's unbelief. Or you go to God and say, okay, I trust you. I will follow you. I will do what you say. And this is nothing about keeping a bunch of rules. Forget the rule thing. This is about having a relationship with God and saying, look, I don't know what's best for me. I've proven that with most of my life. You love me. You go to bat for me. You sent your son for me. I know I can trust you. What do you want me to do? Okay, we're going to do this today. Oh, that sounds terrible. Why'd you let that happen to me? I got a reason. Trust me. Okay, I trust you. I thank you for this situation. Now use it. And then Joseph gets cancer and he's on a mission trip down to MD Anderson all the time. And he's excited about going down there, not just for his treatment, because God uses him down there with a bunch of other people who got cancer. 
And so he's not, oh my, this sucks, and God's being evil. He hates me. And like, you know, no attitude about that. He, he realizes God has allowed something in his life, and he's, use, he's saying, okay, Lord, use me. And part of the tragedy of this for me is you have no idea on the life that you're missing out on and if you don't engage with him. And the lives that are changed, and your life that's changed, and the things you see happen. It's just a mind-boggling way to live. James 1, two more, two more passages and then we're done. James 1, I think the black preachers would say, as I go to my chair, is that right? That's, as I go to my seat, okay, that would be like an early warning. I think Patrick told me that. Um, they were never done, though. So, uh, James chapter 1, verse 19. So then, my beloved brethren, written to Christians, let every man be swift to hear, slow to, uh, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves." Oh, I'm living the Christian life. If you're not doing what he said, you are not living the Christian life. That's what it says. Don't deceive yourself into thinking, oh, it's all okay. It's not okay. It isn't working. Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. He observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he's going to remember what he looks like. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If I hold a mirror up to your face and say, describe yourself. Ooh, I've got a little aging spot right here. And you can tell me everything you see because you see it. But if I pull the mirror down and say, okay, tell me what's on your face. Uh, I'm not sure. You can't describe yourself. So you take the scriptures and you hold it up and you look into the scriptures. And as long as you keep looking into the scriptures, you keep that reflection. You can say, well, that's what's in there. That's what's in there. That's what's in there. I know what the right thing to do is. But if you don't stay in there, you forget. Last one, 1 Peter 3. I'm even making the babies mad. That's terrible, 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 that's terrible. 1 Peter 3, last one, here we go. Verse 8, finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him speak peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Any questions? So here's the dilemma. You, you listened, you watched, you showed up. So what? So what? If you have no intention of doing anything with what you heard, so what? What are you going to do? What is the Holy Spirit saying to you? This has got to change, the, you know. You tune it in, receiver's on, tune it in, say, okay, Lord, what are you telling me? Now, I'm telling you this from personal experience. The first thing he's going to bring to mind is the last thing he brought to mind. Because that's where you left off. And when you w went stick in the mud, hardened your heart, shut down, it was because God said, okay, we got to work on this area. And you said, oh, we ain't working on that. You can't have that. He's like, okay, I'll be here when you get back because I got to ride in you. And so you say, okay, Lord, I don't want to have a hard heart. I don't want to drift away. What do you want me to do? Oh, okay, well, let's go back where we left off. This. 
Well, I don't want to deal with that. Well, then we're just back where we started. You got to yield. Well, I don't want to yield on that. You're not going to get to the next thing till you yield on the thing. It's one of the reasons why baptism is so huge, for instance. People say, oh, I'm a Christian. He says, okay, let's get baptized. Oh, no, no, I don't want to do that yet. And it's an all stop. Why can't I hear God? Why won't he show him anything else? You won't even do the A of the ABCs. Why you want B, C, D, E, F, G? Next step, next step. So it's a process. But you've got to engage in the process by obeying one thing at a time. So I open my Bible, and it says, in everything, give thanks. And I say, close my Bible. That's what I did. I'm not doing that. And eventually I did that. And I burned up a lot of time complaining and whining instead of trusting him and saying, okay, Lord, I thank you. So read your Bible and do what it says. Get up in the morning and say, Lord, here are my hands, my feet, my eyes, my ears, my mouth, my soul, my body, my spirit, my mind, my will, my emotions. I, give, I yield myself to you, a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable. Use me. Put me on and go live your life today. And then you go to the grocery store and he says, go over there and talk to that lady. At first you're going to go, oh my gosh, I'm about to lose my mind. I'm going to look like an idiot. Once you get going and you realize he's, he's way ahead of you, it won't be so hard. You'll be upset when you said no because you, you don't know what you missed. All right, Lord, you're the best. Here we are again, more challenge. And some people are going to get it and some are going to drift away. Some people are going to go away. They, they're upset. They get their panties in the wad because they don't like something or disagree. Lord, help us make sure it's you that we disagree with and not some preacher or somebody's opinion. And make sure we find our complaint in Scripture not in our own desires and something to back up our own sin. Uh, but somebody's going to get it, Lord. Could be in this room, could be somebody watching or listening. Somebody's going to get it. And they're going to put this thing in gear and this Christian thing is going to move again like it never has before. And, and they're going to yield. They're going to obey. They're going to start building a house on a solid foundation by applying what they hear. And then it's game on. And that's when it gets exciting. So, Father, for anybody who hears about all this and knows that they're in trouble, because they really are not in the family even yet. And if they died, they'd be gone forever, not to heaven, but to a real hell. And they would say today, God, I don't know why it took so long, why I've pushed back on this, but I've heard you talking to me about this for a long time. And I understand and believe that Jesus died on that cross, shed his blood, was buried and raised from the dead for me, for my sin, to offer me eternal life. And I accept it all as a free gift. I repent. I'm not going to say that I changed my mind. I can't save me. Only you can save me. My sin is not okay. You're the remedy for it. Come live in me, through me, change me. Thank you that I'm now in your family. Now help me learn how to be an obedient child and follow you and live the life you intended all along. You're the best. Thank you for loving us, for coming after us, for staying after us. Um, how could we ever question whether you want the best for us? Nobody ever cared for us like Jesus. And we will spend eternity trying to thank you for that. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.